Okay, so uh, thanks uh, very much to the, the organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'll talk about uh, product uh, rigidity today. So this, I should say, is a uh, uh, joint work with uh, Mr. Stefan uh, and uh, Rolando Santiago. Both of them at the University of Iowa. Uh, so I want to, I guess, talk about uh, this sort of uh, general uh, theme in uh, group von Neumann algebra theory. So of course, if you have a group, uh, a useful uh, gadget to look at in terms of the representation theory is the less regular representation. Uh, and uh, of course, if uh, you're a compact group, then uh, Peter Vial tells you that uh, uh, in terms of the representation theoretic data, or really just the, the group at all, uh, this contains uh, everything you really want to know uh, or should know. Uh, of course, uh, when we're looking at a countable discrete group, so uh, we'll, we'll usually use uh, capital Greek letters for countable discrete groups. You'll get a countable discrete group. You can look at the, the group von Neumann algebra, which I think almost everybody is familiar with. You just uh, take the, the weak closure uh, of the, the unitaries as they appear in the less regular representation. Uh, and there you go. Uh, of course, if this is ICC, uh, if I don't explicitly say it, uh, most of the time I do mean ICC. Uh, if the group is ICC, this is exactly when uh, you have a T1 factor here. Um, and so the, the general question, well, we would like to classify T1 factors. Uh, in particular, these are, these are nice uh, explicit examples of T1 factors. So think about so generally uh, uh, what kind of uh, von Neumann properties uh, imply actually that there's some kind of uh, properties or structure at the level of the group. Um, so as I said, uh, as soon as you move away from uh, compact second countable, uh, this less regular representation, there's there's a lot of, uh, of loss of information. So. Uh, in particular, a result of Kahn from 1976 tells you that uh, uh, all of these things are essentially the same. Uh, they're all the hyperfinite T1 factor. If uh, gamma is ICC and the mean. In terms of, uh, though, uh, this, this does uh, uh, tell you something. Um, so in terms of uh, analytic properties, uh, this transference uh, has been quite successful. So uh, this gives you, in, in particular, this is a uh, this is a characterization of uh, amenability uh, in terms of some really internal property of the group von Neumann algebra. Uh, another example is uh, there was the notion of property P uh, for the group von Neumann algebra uh, due to Kahn and Jones. Uh, uh, which corresponds to property P for the group uh, in the usual sense of preference. So what I really want to talk about today, though, is, are questions that are not really about sort of analytic properties of a group uh, and how do these properties, uh, uh, or the how properties of the group von Neumann algebra can be conjured to transfer. Uh, so um, 
want some sort of algebraic rigidity uh, type phenomena. Okay, so uh, and lots of open questions about uh, how von Neumann algebras uh, relate to this this question of uh, can you uh, retrieve any algebraic structure of the group uh, somehow just from, from the group von Neumann algebra? Uh, so the, the first kind of uh, famous problem about this is, of course, the Kluge factor problem. And one way you can think about that is, is asking whether uh, you can see the number of, of free products uh, you have just in terms of the the von Neumann structure, the other one is a famous conjecture of Hahn, so this Hahn uh, uh, liquidity conjecture. Uh, and I'll state it in a, a slightly uh, narrower form. So uh, the gamma is a uh, property free lattice. And the question is whether if you have an isomorphism uh, at the, the von Neumann algebra level, uh, can you deduce, or you should be able to deduce, I guess, if I'm writing this as a conjecture, uh, that in fact the, the groups are, are isomorphic. All right, so you can completely recover all of the algebraic information uh, from the group von Neumann algebra in this case. Uh, sometimes it's data just for property P groups. Uh, I've talked to, to several people who, who seem to uh, think that that's uh, uh, probably false. Um, um, no, you, this is on the nose. Uh, in fact, it's even conjectured to be stronger. So, you know, that's an amplification. So, um, uh, but there, there has been some kind of very, and and this is this is mostly this is just mostly a wide open problem at this point. Uh, there's there's been some uh, kind of uh, tentative uh, developments towards this, or some some reason to, to believe uh, this in the lattice case uh, due to some work of Jackie Peterson on uh, uh, classifying spaces. Uh, but that might have some kind of impact uh, on this conjecture. It is, it is a, it is a, but it's, Yes, there's another convert. Yeah, but but somehow in, in spirit they're not completely unrelated. Uh, so certainly the resolution of this. Yeah. Uh, sure. In the uh, in in, in the in the SPN one case, you have a uh, talent Mihadovic. That's that's true. That tells you at least uh, if you have a lattice in SPN one uh, and you have. Uh, well, if you have two lattices, uh, that, uh, in each of them in one of these SPN1 guys, and they're isomorphic, or even stably isomorphic, uh, then they must be lattices in the chain. Um, and, and that's because of uh, an invariant they calculated that differs on the SPN1 theory, but uh, it doesn't differ for, for uh, simple higher rank lattices. Uh, and of course, uh, so this this type of phenomena where you can completely recover uh, all of the algebraic information, this has been uh, termed by Serene as uh, W star super rigidity. Uh, and uh, even though we, we don't know whether uh, property P lattices, for instance, are W star super rigid, uh, there have there yeah. are uh, infinite classes of, of such groups that are structured so. Uh, for instance, I uh, Nuana Popa M 
Voss and a, a variant of this construction by uh, Burbeck and Voss. So there, there are plentiful uh, examples of, uh, of uh, super rigid phenomena, uh, uh, but whether it applies to, to the, these particular groups is the, the big question. Yeah. Uh, so the I want to kind of uh, talk around uh, uh, a, a sort of related uh, weaker uh, type of rigidity, which uh, will be product rigidity. So let me save this. Theorem. Uh, so I'll set it up, and then I'll I'll talk about how it relates to these questions, uh, and uh, I'll give you some idea of how the uh, the proof goes. Uh, so let's uh, say we have a countable discrete group here, uh, which I'm going to write. As a product, I want a non-trivial product here. Uh, and I want all of the sum ends in the product uh, to be, uh, let's say, hyperbolic ICC groups. Non-elementary hyperbolic. So. OK, so we have a nice uh, factor where we generate a factor. And so let's look at this group von Neumann algebra, and let's assume that it's the same, or even, I, I don't want to want to complicate the notation here, but even stable is OK. Um, so suppose uh, uh, that I have uh, another uh, just arbitrary group here, arbitrary countable discrete, um, where I have an isomorphism at the level of the von Neumann algebra. Uh, well, it, we don't get full W star super rigidity, but we can we get some kind of algebraic information out of this. Uh, so we can recover uh, particularly the direct product structure. Uh, so then there exists exactly uh, and many uh, distinct subgroups uh, lambda one through lambda n in lambda uh, such that lambda is the same as the direct product, really internally. Um, uh, and uh, L of gamma i is isomorphic uh, to L of lambda i up to some uh, amplification. Uh, the total order of amplification is fixed at one, though. throw that up there so everybody can see it, and then I'll work on this course. Uh, so you can, you can completely recover. Uh, uh, the, the product structure, uh, you can't quite recover the factors here. Uh, and that's that's a hard limit to this. Uh, so for instance, just using uh, some uh, amplification of uh, three group uh, factors or interpolated three group factors of the Teles group, uh, you can show that, say, L of F2 uh, times L of F9, uh, this von Neumann algebra is, is the same as L of F3. So you, you can't really get it at the level of the components uh, uh, just because this, this amplification here is, is just necessary. Uh, again, because if you uh, amplify and then amplify by the reciprocal, you have a canonical isomorphism.
So that's, that's, that's really a hard limit. Of course, uh, if con rigidity were true for like SPN1 lattices, then uh, that, would, uh, that would fully give you super rigidity for products of SPN1 lattices. Uh, but that's a big if. Uh, so of course this is uh, this didn't happen without uh, plenty of other uh, precedents uh, leading up to it. So probably the uh, the, the really uh, big uh, result in this line before ours was a result of uh, the following Hopa. Okay. Um, uh, and then they they did uh, so they they got. Uh, so-called the unique prime decomposition property uh, for, for such uh, groups of Neumann alphabet. That is to say, if you had uh, this guy and it were isomorphic to something that started as a non-trivial product, not even necessarily of group von Neumann algebras, uh, then you know that. Really, the, the components have to match up. Again, up to some amplification, and uh, uh, of course, M has to be zero. Uh, so, what we did was uh, basically find a way of finding uh, some kind of product decomposition from the group afterwards, uh, we could appeal to this unique prime, the prime decomposition to get uh, the matching up. Um, okay, so uh, what's, the, what's the general uh, philosophy behind uh, why you would think such a thing works or, or why these, these things go through. Um, so if we just look at uh, these, these gamma i's, let's say, uh, as uh, free groups, so non-cyclic uh, free groups, uh, then what we have is, is sort of we have a, a sequence of uh, uh, free products uh, and uh, direct products. And uh, what's, what's really nice uh, with these particular algebraic relations uh, is that we can tell uh, these things apart uh, analytically. So uh, what's happening analytically is that anytime you have a, a, a non-trivial free product, you're, uh, you're allowing uh, in some uh, non-trivial. So this creates uh, non-trivial uh, L2 cohomology. Of course, with the hyperbolic, you have to really be a little really loose with what you mean by cohomology, but uh, that's essentially what's happening. Uh, and uh, anytime you have a, a, a free pro uh, direct product of, of uh, uh, non-amenable things, you're, you're obstructing uh, L2 cohomology. So there's this, uh, there's this really strong interplay between uh, creating, uh, and so what's the, the analytic interpretation is uh, uh, the cohomology allows you to construct flows or in the usual parlance deformations. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the obstruction is some kind of rigidity. And so the idea uh, of playing uh, these two uh, analytic properties against each other, uh, the fact that in some locations you're allowed to uh, flow very freely, uh, while in other locations you're obstructed uh, from flowing uh, much at all, this is uh, the strategy was uh, uh, developed uh, by Siri Hopa.
and it's over the last uh, uh, decade, decade and a half, it's, it's really uh, led to just some uh, amazing uh, uh, results uh, around uh, uh, non-immutable transactions. Of course, uh, you can kind of play the game the other way, um, where, uh, for instance, you can look at groups that are obstructed. So uh, your gamma i's could be non-trivial uh, direct products, for instance, or uh, another kind of rigid or obstructing property is just property p. Well, that's really the the greatest obstructing property of them all. Uh, and then you could allow some kind of free product uh, between these guys. And look at this factor, and then you can look at what happens when you have some other free product on this side. And again, you get the same thing. The factors have to match up up to isomorphism, which is a result of uh, you want to Peterson and Popa. Okay. Um, so this is a this is a very uh, kind of uh, familiar uh, situation, and in some way we're just looking at uh, uh, the other facets and trying to, to play the same same game. So let me uh, now talk about uh, the nuts and bolts that, that go into uh, uh, getting this, this, this creation of uh, this internal direct product uh, in our mystery group. Okay. Uh, so the, the first uh, thing is, uh, well, uh, how are we going to really detect some kind of group structure? And so uh, uh, let me give you just a general answer. Okay, so we know that the, uh, the 2 1 factor itself doesn't give us enough information uh, to reconstruct uh, the group at all. Uh, but uh, we can just uh, add one extra little piece of data that helps us nail things down. And that little piece of data is going to be. Uh, one of the main tools for uh, uh, getting this, this rigidity uh, construction. Okay, so uh, we look at this co-multiplication map. Okay, and so what it does, well really we think about this as the tensor product. Uh, and so what this does is, it, well it just sends uh, the canonical unitary approaches to G. to the tensor of that unitary with itself. Okay. And so uh, this may have been essentially folklore, uh, but I think the first written instance I saw of this was a paper of Walter uh, from the 60s, maybe the late 50s, I can't quite remember, but uh, if, we, if you consider the pair, Uh, of the group with the co-multiplication. Let me just decorate it. Okay. So this pair. Uh, from this group. Okay. What's, uh, what's one way to see this? Well, uh, what you can do is you can, you can pre-dualize. And so you, the pre-dual is the Fourier algebra of the group. Uh, the pre-dual of this co-multiplication is just the regular multiplication on the Fourier algebra. And you can check that the group unitaries are essentially in correspondence, uh, well, plus or minus one with the, the minimal uh, non-zero eigenvalues in the, the Fourier algebra. Okay. So If we add this one extra little piece of data uh, into the mix, um, 
and we can use that to uh, we can use uh, somehow this this co-multiplication to hopefully uh, extract a good chunk of the group structure uh, just from some analytic properties we know. Okay, uh, and really this. Uh, this idea of, of this, this co-multiplication in, in terms of using it with deformation rigidity. Uh, this goes back to Jesse Peterson and Adrian Iwana around the same time. Uh, and it was developed into a little bit of a, uh, a more general theory by Kobel and Voss. Now these are so-called height arguments. You don't really need an exact matchup with the co-multiplication, you can somehow have uh, a little bit of quantitative give in that. Okay. Uh, the other the other ingredients uh, that we need, uh, well, uh, of course, if we're looking at products uh, of things uh, and we want a, a product type rigidity phenomena, we, we need somehow a way uh, of controlling uh, product type structures in our group bundling algebra. So uh, we really need some kind of control of, of, of commutation. So we need this co-multiplication to kind of pull the group structure out. Uh, and then we, we need some way of controlling uh, or locating uh, where we have commutation relations uh, in, in the von Neumann algebra. Of course, the, the first and most famous example uh, of this uh, is Ozawa. Uh, okay, so this is a so-called fluidity theorem. Okay. And so it basically says for one non-elementary hyperbolic group, uh, if I have a, a diffuse sky, Also due to Ozawa, more pertinent to this is this generalized uh, fluidity. Okay, well, we're looking at some kind of product group now. And of course, there's tons of commutation because we have a product, but uh, the, the, the commutation that happens in the von Neumann algebra is, is not so arbitrary. So if we again, have something diffuse in here. Uh, and we know that it has a large commutant. So let's say it's non-immutable. Okay. Well, there's no unexpected place where, where this A can be. This A is, is you know, it's, it's sitting essentially, or a large chunk of it is sitting essentially uh, in some in some uh, in some sum n. Okay. Uh, and then uh, beyond this, we don't actually just it turns out need to control uh, uh, just commutation, but we really need to actually at some point uh, locate normalization. Uh, and again, there, there are similar results for locating normalization uh, in the hyperbolic group uh, and in the product group uh, due to uh, Kunitsa, myself, and then uh, uh, Kunitsa, myself, and Bogdan and Drea, uh, of course, for the free groups. Uh, uh, this was first and really that was the, the, the breakthrough uh, prototype for these, these later results with hyperbolic. Uh, this was done by Osama and Popa. Um, uh, so there's, there's a generalized uh, so-called strong fluidity. And this uh, 
here it's the same except with commutation. You just replace commutation with normalizing, and then you can still locate palpable. So there's no surprising normalization relation here. Uh, and that's going to actually come in in a significant, a significant way. Uh, so those are all of the, the main ingredients. Now how do you assemble these uh, ingredients uh, to construct such a thing? Okay. Uh, well, uh, step one uh, is just to get some kind of uh, non-amenable uh, commuting term. Okay. So although this is the Lambda, so I, they're not necessarily in there with, with finite index. They're not in any kind of internal direct product position. Uh, it just gets some commutation started. Okay, and so this is this is where we use the co-multiplication trick, uh, along with solidity. So this gives you a feel for uh, really how how the the heart of the argument goes. Okay. Uh, so we start with the the mystery group. Uh, lambda, and we look at the lambda co-multiplication. So we think about this as, uh, well, a priori, it's going to scramble up uh, the, the gamma structure pretty badly, but uh, let's think this through a little bit. slightly misstated this. Of course, it doesn't really fit necessarily into uh, exactly one, but it, it could fit into some kind of subset, uh, some non-trivial subset of, of the set. Um, all right, well, let's look at the image of, let's say, the first copy. Uh, so the image of this thing, wherever it lies, uh, it's going to have a, a large commutant, uh, which is the, the image of uh, L of gamma 2. Okay. Well, that large commutant can't come from any kind of weird uh, situation, so this thing essentially has to, and again, up to some kind of conjugation and take, taking a corner, so some large chunk of it has to fit in at most three of the, the indices. You can't exceed... Uh, that you have one one is essentially blank space. Okay. Uh, so what does this tell you? Uh, well, uh, using some kind of uh, intertwining argument, uh, due to Shireen, uh, this tells you that uh, there has to be an infinite sequence of uh, hard unitaries from lambda, uh, which are essentially uh, sitting in one of these things. So you've taken this mystery group and you've kind of pushed some sequence to one side or the other. Okay. Of course, I, I'm being a little bit or very generous uh, by uh, what I mean by almost containment. But that's the essential flavor of what's going on. You've kind of pushed one sequence over. Now, if we have some kind of collection of subgroups, of lambda, OK, uh, let's suppose we have something a little stronger, and suppose, let's say, we can't really push uh, lambda 1 uh, into any of these guys. Okay. Well, then not only does this argument get that we have some kind of sequence escaping to infinity, uh, but the way this thing escapes uh, is that the, the lambdas are uh, not in, well, 
they're they're in the the complement um, of any kind of translate uh, of one of these subgroups. So we have this sequence going to infinity that 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 gets pushed away uh, from any of these these subgroups. And so what's, what's happening with the other uh, land i? Let's suppose this sequence is, is sitting in the lambda 1 direction. Then what's happening with the lambda 2? There's some, there's some kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's commuting with all of these lambdas, right? Okay. And so there's this ultra product uh, technique of, uh, of Iwana. Uh, which in fact tells you that that lambda two it's it's sitting uh, uh, as commutants of, of things that are not in any element uh, of G. Uh, so uh, uh, that's that's actually literally true. So this lambda two, let's say, or this lambda i bar, so the, the complementary lambda i. Uh, sorry, sorry, gamma. Sorry, yes, gamma. So this gamma uh, is really, it has to be pushed into uh, uh, L of uh, the centralizer, or the commutant in lambda, of uh, some uh, family of, well, let's call them omega. Omega S is a decreasing family. Omega S is not uh, in this family of G. Okay. So literally, it's yeah. hmm? uh, S is just a. It, I'm just indexing the natural numbers. Uh, okay, so there's just a sequence of of these. Uh, subgroups that are not in this family of subgroups G, uh, where uh, the other gamma uh, components is sitting in uh, the the union of the centralizers of these things. Okay, so it's commute. It's sitting in the commutant of some things that are not in in this collection, right? Which you get from you know you can almost kind of see. Right, there's a non-trivial argument here that, you know, uh, that's required. Uh, and so uh, we get this dichotomy then. So either uh, one of the copies of gamma has to essentially sit uh, in uh, uh, this family, whatever that family is, or uh, the other copy has to, uh, if we're talking about two copies, let's talk about two copies for simplicity. Okay. Or the other copy of the two um, uh, has to be sitting in some kind of commutant uh, uh, of this element. Okay. Uh, so what happens then if we look at the, the class G, which we're going to say that this is the uh, the class of subgroups of lambda where uh, the, uh, the the centralizer or the, yeah, the centralizer uh, in lambda uh, is non immutable okay this family is is non empty um, because the trivial subgroup is in there. Um, okay. Uh, well, what if uh, one of our copies doesn't uh, uh, sit below one of these guys? Uh, well, then the other copy is sitting in some kind of union of amenable things, which is still amenable. Uh, but both of these copies are non amenable, so that, that can't happen. Uh, 
it's not it's not immutable, so it isn't immutable. Yeah. So not being in the class means your centralizer is immutable. Yeah. There's lots of negation. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I now you see that that uh, there's there's quite a, a, a chunk of work that's been done for you. So in fact, we get let's say the first copy, uh, basically sitting under uh, one of these guys, and then it's uh, let's call it C uh, sigma prime. Okay, so sigma prime is its uh, centralizer, right? And these these cube form. Of course, since we have a non-immutable thing sitting under this, that immediately tells you that the sigma is non-immutable. And so we have two commuting non-immutable subgroups. And in fact, we have, uh, for one of the guys, we actually have one of the, the, the sum ends sitting under it. So that's a, that's a very strong uh, initial start. And now it, it becomes a game of, of really just uh, abusing this, this solidity and strong solidity phenomena to, to further nail down exactly how these groups sit. Okay. So what are some examples of, of how this goes? What are some more steps? Um, I first want to argue that in fact this, this gamma one uh, is actually uh, and again, it, it's just kind of being conjugated, or a large chunk of it's being conjugated. I want to sweep all of that under the rug because that's just technical details and not really the essence of what's going on. Uh, I want to say that this essentially has to equal uh, uh, L of sigma. Okay. Well. Uh, let's suppose not. Suppose this thing is sitting like into the index, okay? Uh, then what's happening is you can essentially show, and again, this takes a lot of work, there's some kind of diffuse uh, 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 commutator uh, of this, uh, which generates. This thing is diffuse, and essentially these things are generating L of sigma. Okay. Well, uh, but now remember, sigma has a, a large commutant, right? Which means we can locate all of this stuff uh, in one of the copies of L gamma or the other, or L gamma one or L gamma two, but then Ozawa solidity tells you you can't have this, this operator. Okay. Um, so you get that at least this, this part has to be atomic. And, and that tells you, well, that's essentially, you can think about this as, as it's being conjugated into a finite index cube. Okay. So it, it's almost uh, all, of, all of that sigma. Okay. That's one, one of many. So there's, there's many, many. Uh, yes, it did in the, in the first step. Uh, you needed the generalized solidity to, to locate it into uh, a smaller number of, of copies. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so what are, what are some other uh, uh, things that are going on? Well, okay, so now we have this uh, uh, this sigma that's that's essentially like L gamma of one, okay? So, um, and uh, we have it. Uh, this thing is, is sitting inside of gamma, okay? Uh, so, what is the? How do you think about the commutant? Uh, of this guy. Well, it, it's sitting as a group in lambda. So, where where are things in the commutant coming from? Uh, well, they're coming from uh, elements in lambda such that uh, if you conjugate them by sigma and you look at the orbit size, 
and that has to be finite, right? That's the only way you're going to introduce uh, commutation for, for a, a, a subgroup uh, 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 subfactor. Yeah. All right, well, uh, then you have some kind of filtration uh, of these by the orbit size, and you want to show that the orbit size can't grow too big, right? So that essentially the commutants of this thing uh, of sigma is, is essentially really the, the commutants in a second term. Oh, the other thing to note is that, well, now sigma and, and sigma prime, uh, they can't really have a very big intersection at all, again, because if they did, uh, then uh, this guy would have a large centralizer, but that thing is essentially L of gamma 1, so again, solidity is preventing that, right? So if they have to be in direct product position, they can't have any kind of intersection, right? So these things have small intersections. And so all you really need to know is then that the sigma prime basically gives you the rest of the, the algebra, which means that uh, the orbit size has to, has to stabilize itself. Well, the, the orbits can't really intrude again on, on the sigma part because otherwise then you get some kind of, actually by looking at this tower and the way they intersect sigma, you get some kind of normal subequivalence relation sitting in, inside of sigma. And again, the, the strong solidity now is, is obstructing this. Okay. Um, so really the, these orbits, they're all stacked up on the sigma prime. They're away from the sigma. Okay. And now why, why does the orbit size have to stabilize? Well, uh, the bigger the orbit is, right? Uh, so you can, this plus the, the commutant is generating the whole algebra, okay? The bigger the orbit size, the less efficient you are at generating this, right? Um, so the fact that this and this have to, um, uh, I wanna say, um, uh, you, you, you know, you don't get, you can't get any kind of commutant at all if you have uh, uh, arbitrarily large orbit size because you're, you're pushing the size of the commutant smaller and smaller, right? The, the, the size or the index of the commutant is, is related with the, the reciprocal of the orbit size. Okay. And so you, you, would, you, would, you would not get a significant commutant if, if you allowed the orbit size. And, and so that's, uh, of course, everything is, is very annoying technicality because everything is not up to like finite group index, it's finite Kinsner Popa index, so you're not necessarily quite in the factor situation, you know, conjugating things around. You have to play with projections and corners and stuff like this, but uh, that's, that's the, the essence of, of why it works. So it's, it's really, uh, you know, using the co multiplication to, to kind of uh, get a little bit of algebra information and then using the fact that you can locate commutants very well uh, to, to push that to a, uh, a full direct product realization. And I'm out of time. So. Like uh, what kind of, well, you can always tack on, I guess, uh, uh, you can always take this product and tack on uh, an amenable thing and then the amenable things have to match up. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's essentially in in the, the lemmas that are that are there. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you get, get the meeting. Ah, yes. Of course, yes, he, he later uh, 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 kind of fleshed this out a little bit more, but you're right, it's, it's, it's already there. 